to show you how to get started with um, colored pencil tinting rather than crayon tinting, which is what we normally do. But um, I'm going to give you the high points as far as shading and tinting and all of that kind of thing to get depth. I'll let you um, go to the crayon tinting tutorial because it's the same information. It's just we're using a different medium. Um, I'm using, this is what I'm going to use in my patterns, are the Prismacolor Premier colored pencils. And uh, something important about them that you need to know is uh, try not to drop them on a hard surface because they'll kind of shatter inside and the lead will fall out as you sharpen them. Um, another thing is that they should be sharpened with a, a pencil sharpener, a hand pencil sharpener, rather than uh, an electric one or, or a, a rotary one. It's just gentler on them. Because their lead isn't like a pencil lead, it's uh, it's much softer. Um, the same um, FunTac mounting putty that we use to take off crayon off the fabric, we'll use uh, for the pencil too. It uh, it'll take off pretty much as well as it does the you take the crayon off and that's a, a matter of dabbing not rubbing and then next we have other tools are these these are paper blending stumps and they're real inexpensive uh, I like to have a few different sizes so that you have different different end sizes, different tip sizes to do in little areas or larger areas. And um, you need to know how to keep them clean and sharp. And all you have to do is get a plain old cheapo emery board nail file and just um, just file the the remnants of whatever color you have on there off or sharpen them or delving in if you need to. It cleans them right up, but you do want to work at it a little more than that so you get all the color off. I shouldn't have done that on top of there, but I did. And our next tools are for this. Is This is the medium that I'm going to be using. It's Jacquard um, Textile Colorless Extender. What it is is Jacquard Textile Paint Colorless Extender. And these are the size paint brushes that I like to use. Um, it's not very often that you have a huge just open area, but this is a size 12 um, sable flat watercolor brush. And this is the one that I use most often. And it's just kind of really all purpose um, because you can do large areas with it. It's a size 6. Um, sable watercolor brush and it's flat. It's got this nice flat little um, straight across end on it which really comes in handy rather than a pointy one and you have uh, the ability to do little tiny skinny areas and wider areas. Alright, let's get started. The only thing, I, I want to mention this even though I don't need it right at the moment, it's nice to have a little scrap piece of either paper or clean fabric to put down that your hand can rest on while you're doing this because the pencil will rub onto this part of your hand and it will rub off onto the clean areas that you don't want color on. So it's nice to have a, something there that you can use as kind of a mask just to keep your hand on while you're working. But I'm not really going to need it for right now. Uh, the same rules of, you know, working from light to dark. It's the same as uh, with the, the crayon. And also the same is use a light hand and a little round motion, a little round uh, circular motion. And all you do, it's just so stinking simple, is you come in and you start tinting or shading. It's important that you don't use a real sharp pencil. If this pencil wasn't flat on the tip, 
I would have um, a real straight little lines like this as I'm working and I don't want that. I want that flat edge so it gives me a nice little soft soft edge little line. I'm going to come in with I'm going to skip and go to something quite a bit darker and put some dark in here just a little. One thing with the pencils that is a little bit different than um, than crayon is at this point when once you have a light area down you want to come in and blend the light areas with your blending stump. And I'm pushing pretty hard. You want to do light areas first because it will pull into, you can see right there that it, it moved the color in to that white area. So if you have anything that you intend to make a lot darker, it's good to get the light areas blended first before you come in with the dark stuff. I'm going to come in with a much darker shading here. You can see how dark that is. And if I had had that on there when I blended the first time, it would have been pulled off into these areas and completely changed the look. So now I can come in and blend that. And you can see that it gets pulled into the other areas. So you want to be careful of where you're actually pushing that color around to. It's just as simple as that. I really can't show you any more than that. It's just coloring, blending, and then we'll fix it. And I'll open up my fixative. This stuff is um, kind of the consistency of Mod Podge. If you've ever worked with Mod Podge, you can see that it's like a real thin kind of glue. And all you have to do is just paint it on. I like to start in the light areas first because this will also move around and I already made a mistake. I should have had this on freezer paper because I found that it, see what it did to the table? I'm going to wipe that off. It pulls color down in um, through the fabric of course and it pulls it down onto your work surface. So I found putting it on freezer paper really helps. And if I was working on anything larger than this, this little tiny area here, I would pin it down because uh, you might be working with blue and green and red and um, it'll pull that down onto your work surface. And if your um, fabric isn't pinned to the freezer paper, and it moves around on top of that, it will get that color in areas you don't want it. Anyway, you can see that wasn't a big gloppy um, coating of that. It's just gotten it wet. That's all you have to do is get it totally wet. And you'll see that it soaked through. And you clean that off with a damp paper towel is all you need to do. And then you can reuse your, your freezer paper work table over and over and over again. But at this point, after it was completely done, of course, but I would, um, once you have the fixative on, all you have to do is just hang this up to dry. And I like to just kind of, you know, prop one edge up on the edge of the table or something like that and let it hang over. And it just takes a few hours and it'll be dry enough that you can heat set it. Um, all you have to do to heat set it is to, uh, um, hit it with an iron. No, you don't have to put anything on it or under it, but just hit it with an iron for about the count of 10 all over the whole thing and you're ready to, you're ready to stitch. I do want to talk to you about cleaning your brush though. Uh, this is not a cheap brush. 
if you're using a sable brush, you want to take care of them. It's not just a craft brush. Um, you want to keep your the hairs of it in place and not broken, not splayed out. So when you clean it, um, use uh, cool running water and make sure that you, let's say this is the bottom of your sink and the water's running right here. You want to dab it like this. You don't want to ever jab it into the, into the bottom of your glass or your sink or whatever because it'll splay the brushes out, the, the bristles out and they'll break and they'll fall out and they'll get in your work and it'll just ruin a perfectly good brush. So just take some care of it. Once it's completely clean, make sure that you make it its shape that it's supposed to be again, that nice little flat little shape and then set it up to dry. Um, that, I can't make it more difficult than it is, and it's just not difficult. So, like I said, uh, if you want information on actual shading, go to the crayon tinting tutorial and watch it, because it'll give you all the, the, um, the ways to, you know, make sure you get that depth, um, in your tinting. That's all there is to it. I hope you have fun. Music